Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for attending this evening. Uh, my name is Rachel Young, and uh, to my left is Rachel O'Donnell. Um, we're from M Agency and we'll be facilitating this evening. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before I hand it off to Walt. Uh, so if you are having any technical challenges, please chat to Rachel or I, any Rachel will do. Uh, and if you have questions throughout the, um, throughout the talk, please put them in the Q&A. So chat if you're having challenges, Q&A if you have a question for lab or anyone on the panel. Um, so with that, uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Walt and we'll get started. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Walt Birdsall and I work for the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department and we're excited to have uh, our webinar tonight on, on lawns and learn all about lawns from, from Lad Smith. I'd like to introduce to you uh, real quickly, uh, Todd Smith from the uh, University City of University Place, one of our sponsors of the, the uh, event tonight and also Tina Friedrich and Cindy Callahan, both from the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. And they run a program called Taps Wise, which is uh, trying to make sure that lake taps uh, water stays clean. Uh, the Natural Yard Care Program, uh, what we do, why we are involved with this for the health department is uh, we, along with the city of, of University of Place and TAPSWISE, want to encourage people to use less chemicals on their yard, just because a lot of that stuff runs off into streams and into lakes and even into groundwater and eventually makes it into Puget Sound too. So uh, we're trying to go real natural on our, on our properties because the rain does take that stuff down the drain. And we always say, let's just have rain go down the drain. That's the only thing that really should go down the drain. I also uh, involved with a program called Dirt Alert and that's uh, arsenic and lead that's left over from the old smelter. And they uh, smelted copper up in the north end of Tacoma, right by, by Point Defiance Park at Rust, the little town of Ruston for about a hundred years where the new Point Ruston development is right now. And in that process uh, spread arsenic and lead throughout the area, about a thousand square uh, miles of area here. Um, and uh, we do a free soil test if you live in that, in, in the area of what we call the Tacoma Smelter Plume. If you're interested in learning more about that, you could go to the uh, Tacoma Pierce County Health Department website and, and look at healthy homes. That section, you'll see arsenic and lead in the soil and uh, let us know if you're interested in having your soil tested if you live in that area. So uh, just to let you know that this uh, record, this. A webinar this evening is being recorded and we've recorded uh, some other webinars that have been posted on our Tacoma Pierce County Health Department website and also the University City of University Place website. So there is a resource for you too if you haven't been able to see uh, some of our other webinars or join us in that. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, Lad Smith. And Lad, Lad has uh, helped us out with some other webinars, um, but tonight he's going to focus a, more, a little bit more on uh, just on lawns because lawns take so much resources and uh, we really want to find out how we can do this in a, in a really natural organic way. But Lad is uh, super knowledgeable and he, he has his own videos that are available too and he'll put those in the chat. I believe he's going to post the uh, link there. Um, he has a degree from the University of Nevada in ornamental horticulture. Uh, he's a co-founder of the In Harmony Sustainable Landscaping Company. He's been doing that for many years. He's an expert in organic landscape practices, and he can answer all your questions regarding uh, landscape going natural on your land on your yard. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lad. And Lad, great to have you, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Walt, very much. Okay, I'm going to get right to it here, share screen. And I'd also like to thank uh, everyone else who's put this together. So uh, Todd, Tina, Cindy, and Rachel and Rachel, they really put a lot of work in getting this stuff together for everybody. So uh, um, thanks everybody for your efforts too. Okay, so okay. from beginning, cool, everybody see that? Yes, okay. So that's half the battle right there, right? Right there, just it's like showing up for work. That's half the battle. So, okay, here we go. Natural lawn care. Um, as uh, uh, Walt mentioned, you know, really out of all of our gardening practices, we found that lawn care has our biggest impact on our environment 
um, and sometimes on our own health, all the products that we're using out there, you know. So sometimes in our in our want to achieve like the perfect lawn, um, uh, we use a lot of resources like water. We have a we have a huge impact on our solid waste systems by all the clippings and everything that goes into our solid waste. Um, a lot of products that we put on our lawns end up in our storm drains, as they were mentioned, through surface water runoff, which is just rain moving through our urban environment. And then ultimately, as they mentioned, everything ends down to the, the Puget Sound or the lowest body of water and stuff. So in our quest to have these, these perfect lawns, we're finding that we're having a huge impact on just a lot of other entities around us. Um, so we just need to think about doing it a little different. And there has been different thoughts about natural, you know, about lawn care, right? I mean, you have some people that are really into their lawns, intensive care of the lawn, um, golf courses, intensive care of grass plants and stuff. And then like this lawn right here where it's completely natural, you know, just do nothing at all. But really for everyone's be uh, best needs and also for just having a really nice lawn, we want something in the middle like this. And this is um, <clears throat> a lawn that we help take care of and stuff. Look at this lawn. It's green. It's lush. It's thick. It's vigorous growing. And I'll tell you that this type of growth, this type of lawn is your number one moss control and your number one weed control because you're using mother nature to help outcompete mother nature. Um, so this is what we're looking for. And really anything we can do to um, not only have this type of lawn really makes it more enviro environmental benefit when we're doing it with a natural approach, okay? So what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight is uh, a few thoughts about healthy soils, and then I'll go over the six steps of natural lawn care. Um, uh, some renovation work is mostly just like if you need weed control or aeration overseeds and stuff. And then a lot of it is rethinking lawn areas too, because a lot of times we try to grow lawn in areas that might not be where the grass is gonna be very successful long-term. And if it's not successful, that means other plants, moss, uh, broadleaf plants, other things are moving in there because that's how mother nature works. So sometimes to just rethink some of our lawn areas and maybe redo it, especially in the Pacific Northwest, where we can have some beautiful garden areas and stuff, is really a way to go uh, for best long term. Okay. And I kind of, we were talking about a little bit earlier, but just so, you know, the natural yard care pamphlet is really what this whole talk and the natural yard care uh, program is built upon. And the number one step in natural yard care is building healthy soils. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Number two is the right plant in the right place. And I kind of mentioned that too, that if lawn's not the right plant in the right place, then it really struggles and you're going to have a lot more problems. And then number three is, um, is smart watering. Or, and then number four is thinking twice before using any pesticides. And then number five is natural lawn care. So in the natural yard care program, Natural lawn care gets its own title. And so there's a couple pages in this pamphlet, but there's also a really good pamphlet that's available with even more information about natural lawn care, including other uh, links and stuff like that. So as your journey to try to have a better lawn through these properties and stuff. So a lot of good information for you there too, on top of what we'll talk about. Um, but really for healthy lawns, for health, and I don't even really for any good garden plant, um, uh, uh, vegetables, flowers, trees, shrubs, lawn, whatever it is, the whole key is the soils. And the better the soils, the better the plants because you have a better root system growing down below and stuff. And really for us in Pacific Northwest, because a lot of us have to deal, especially with uh, if we're in developments like that, but a lot of glacier till that we're dealing with, um, which is just the subsoil that they had to build on without having good organic matter in there, the, the soils really struggle, which means that the plants really struggle. So Whatever we can do to add organic matter to our soils, either beforehand by amending, and that's what uh, amend means, is like you're putting compost or organic matter into your soil and you're mixing it all together and then you plant on top of it. Or I'll even show you a couple of ways that if you have an existing lawn and you want to get organic matter on there, how you can do that through a top dressing method and stuff. But if we're always thinking about good soils, we're always thinking about how we're going to add organic matter to those soils on a continuous basis to help feed the soil, okay? And really, this is like night and day what the difference can be. These are some studies they did at the University of Washington where they were studying storm water, okay? And so what they did is they planted one lawn on our regular glacier till, just that gray clay stuff that we have to deal with. Um, and then the other lawn they planted on top of um, soil glacier till, but amended with compost before 
they planted the lawn. And look at this upper lawn. It's already yellowing. It's already starting to thin out. It's already getting some weeds and some moss growing in there because it's not a happy lawn. But look at the difference of this lawn. Thick, lush. Look at the color. It's nice and green. That's what we're looking for in our lawns. And the only difference between this one and this one is that they added compost to this one before they planted, okay? And the whole key for this, again, based on stormwater, is that they put water at the top and they let the water run down here and they collected it at the bottom down here. So both of these, let water they're at, a, at a slant, put water at the top, let it run down, collected the water. And what they found by just having a lawn that's thicker, that's lusher, that's better, it allows that water to slow down, it allows that water to spread out and allows that water to sink into the soil. So by just having a nicer lawn, they had 50% reduction in stormwater runoff immediately. So already by having a nice lawn with an organic soil base and doing it right, we are uh, an environmental benefit by reducing anything that's coming off of this lawn into the environment by 50% immediately, plus it's a nicer lawn. So organic matter is a huge key for having a healthy lawn, okay? So everything I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight is really about feeding the soil, which in turn takes care of our plants, okay? So just know that all these natural lawn care practices support a healthy soil system, which support a healthy grass plant, okay? So here's the six steps of natural lawn care. A lot of these people we already do, we're just gonna to try to change it up a little bit to make it better for the plant and better for the environment. So I'll talk about mowing, I'll talk about fertilizing, I'll talk about watering, I'll talk about the, um, uh, <clears throat> the uh, cultural practice of an aeration overseed and a top dress. And then again, if you're doing all these, you really should have minimal problems, which you don't have to use any pesticides, hopefully. Or if you are, you're going to think twice before using any of those. And then again, if you're doing all these and still the lawn is not happy, it's probably just the wrong plant, wrong place, and we need to rethink that, okay? So, but the first one's mowing. And probably the easiest, most simple thing uh, that everyone does is to mow the lawn. But sometimes it can be a big challenge. I actually found this when I was driving in Bellevue where these people um, wrote down the chore list on their garage door. You're like, you know, mow the lawn, do the dishes, you know. It's like, uh, if it's kind of that strife, then there's some major challenges in the household. But if there's not, the easiest things you can do is to, for your lawn is to sharpen the blade, okay? Sharpen the blade once a year to have a sharpened blade or even a new blade um, is one of the most simplest things to do and you'll have a better looking lawn immediately, okay? Because it doesn't have to be razor sharp, but it needs to be sharp enough that it's cutting the grass plant instead of beating the grass plant, okay? And um, the huge challenge is that this is an injury to the grass plant, it doesn't matter. So when we're mowing, it's an injury to the plant. Now, the plant responds well from it, when it's been cut and not beat. So you can see this, like it's cut, nice spray, the lawn stays green afterwards. But I've seen lawns that have like this yellow haze all over them. And it's because when the lawn's been beat with a mower blade instead of cut, it frays it. And so this top half of the grass plant dies off. And then it just kind of looks um, a straw color. And it just gives you this haze on top of the lawn. So number one difference you can do is just use a sharp blade. So, you can go to a, an equipment place and they can put a, 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 a cut on it uh, once a year. Or again, like myself, sometimes I just buy a new blade. It's like $30. I buy a new blade, put it on there, and my whole lawn looks better all the time by using a sharp blade. Okay. So sharp blade, and then we need to mow a little taller. The grass plants, and I'll talk to them a little bit later when I'm talking about seeding and grasses. But the grasses that we grow around here, they like to be mowed about two and a half to three inches. Okay. They like to be kept in that range. And when we're mowing at that range, for a lot of people at first, it might seem a little shaggy um, until you start seeing the results from mowing at a taller height, okay? So a lot of us have been, um, uh, a lot of us has been shown that we should be mowing lawns like a quarter inch because it's a golf course look. And if anybody's ever gone to a golf course, when they raise up those garage doors in the morning, there's like a hundred people in there trying to make lawn look happy when it's cut this short, okay? Especially in the Pacific Northwest. So takes a lot of effort to keep the lawn looking okay when you're only cutting at a quarter or at half an inch. So around here, our lawns like to be cut two and a half to three inches, okay? 
They also, we want to uh, cut when we're doing our mowing, we call the one third rule, okay? Which means we never cut off more than a third of the grass blade per mowing, okay? So you don't, if you're gonna cut it two and a half inches, you don't let it get up to 10 inches and try to bring it down. You really wanna stay on top of the mowing to keep the, um, the grass blade growing, but yet never removing more than one third when we're doing our mowing, okay? So that's just a good general practice. And the, the main part of mowing a little taller is that for a uh, horticultural world, the grass plant's a very unique plant. You know, all the other plants, trees, shrubs, everything else, all their energy goes out to the tips all the time. Every year it goes out to the tips and the plants get larger and larger and larger with this energy growth and stuff like that. But for grass plants, all the growth comes from this crown area right here, okay? And they have the root zone, it's like a transition area. So you have your root zone down below and then you have your grass blades, the green tissue growing up on top of that, but the crown really is the most important part. And the green tissue, the grass blades, are really the plant's little photosynthesizing cells to help it grow. So we wanna leave as much of that as possible when we mow, okay? And studies have shown, they've done tremendous amount of studies on lawns and how they grow. And they have shown that if we cut too short, our root systems correspond to that. If we cut a taller height, we get a better root system down below. A better root system down below means you have a better plant on top. So it's a chicken and egg thing. So you wanna cut taller, a better root system down below. And then the plant also starts sending out side shoots. So you will naturally thicken up your lawn by mowing taller because when the lawn's happy, when it really feels like it's in a good growth stage, it will send out side shoots to thicken up itself. Now, if the lawn's not happy, it won't do any of that. It just kind of stays this way. So you want a thick lawn, mow at a taller height, okay? And what we've seen too is that if you mow, like if you have a lawn that's green like this, and then you mow it and it's yellow, what you're doing is you're cutting right down to the crown. You're cutting down to the crown and not leaving any grass blade for that lawn to recover from that, okay? And so that means the lawn then has to take reserves from its root system to help it recover from that to start growing again. So it'd be like us having to use our savings to pay bills every single month. It's not sustainable, it's not gonna work. So lawns that are cut too short, that are constantly having to use their reserves will eventually start dying off because they don't have the root system or the, the um, supply system to be able to keep it a, ha a happy plant. So we never wanna cut so it's so low that you just see it yellow. We always want to be green. And I've talked to many people and they say that they like to cut it low because the lawn doesn't grow as much. And it's like, that is true, but that's the wrong approach. We want the lawn to grow. We want the lawn to be thick. We want the lawn to be vigorous growing. We want the lawn to be taller. So it's out competing all the weeds and moss that are trying to get into our lawn, okay? And again, they have done studies. They show we mow low, plant's doing okay. It can recover that, but it's using reserves from its root system in order to grow back like that. When we grow our lawns taller and we mow taller, our root systems become better because the plant then is able to recover from this cutting, which is an injury again, photosynthesizing and keeping that energy flow going, meaning it's bringing down energy and, and reserves down to its root system, which means now the root system is happy enough to send out side shoots. So it's a whole thing, mowing taller, you will find you have a better lawn. Two and a half to three inches is a perfect zone, okay? So that's where you wanna be, two and a half. And then as much as possible, if we can mulch mow, which is just using a different blade instead of one cutting surface, it has multiple cutting surfaces. If we can use a mulch mowing um, blade, so instead of leaving like big clippings like this, it leaves little, little teeny bitty bitty ones like this one and leaves them right down and blows it down in the soil, you'll never see it. The key about this is that these little pieces now are adding to our soil surface, adding organic matter every time you mow. These are also green, which is nitrogen, which is the, nu the nutrient that makes lawns uh, green. So now we're adding an organic fertilizer every time you mulch mow with these little clippings going back down and composting and um, those nitrogen molecules being reused by the plant. So mulch mowing is absolutely wonderful when it's done correctly with a good blade that's sharp. And again, it has this sharp edge and then it also has multiple edges. There's a bunch of different designs. Every mowing uh, company has their own designs. So some of them are like multiple blades, like a razor blade, like we shave with, but this one is set up where it cuts once and all these multiple, 
all these other multiple blades cut up into those small pieces. And they have found that we spend a third of our time removing clippings from our mowing operations. So you mow, you get a full bag, you have to remove it, take it somewhere. We'll spend a third of our time just removing clippings. So you don't do that, you mulch, you leave all those grass blades on the soil surface. Now you've saved yourself a bunch of time too. So mow taller, mow a little more often when we have to when we get our surges because the lawn's growing now and use a mulching blade. And again, mowing a little more often means that in springtime when we get our big surge, we might have to mow more than once a week. It might have to be every five days. So we're not allowing it to get so tall that we're having to bring it down hard. So we don't want it to get up where it gets to five inches and we have to bring it down to two and a half inches. We want it to get up to three, three and a half inches and then we mow. So mowing a little more frequently, especially if you're mulch mowing, means you can go out and just cut it really fast and be done with it. But we always have a, a big spring growth surge. Then it slows down during our summertime. And then we have another fall time recovery when things cool down like in September and October and the fall rains come back. So mowing up in the Pacific Northwest means you might be mowing a little more often here, a little more often here, and maybe once every two, maybe two and a half weeks in the summertime. So every lawn's different, but in order to keep up on it, you have to mow according to the plant growth, okay? So step number one is mowing a little higher, mowing a little more regularly and leave the clippings by mulch mowing as much as possible. Number two is fertilizing. <clears throat> and really for most lawns, they do need an extra shot of nutrition now and then. Now, if you're mulch mowing, you're naturally, like I said, leaving a little bit of nitrogen fertilizer, but to add some uh, nutrition to the lawn really helps it with its growth pattern and stuff um, because they, they do like it. So, but we wanna use organic fertilizers. We wanna use slow release fertilizers. So these, these nutrients don't get washed away in our, in our and our stormwater runoff and stuff like that. So we don't want to use weed and feed anymore. We don't want to use quick release fertilizers. We want to use natural, organic, or slow release. And I usually recommend going to a good garden store. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with like local garden stores down in your area, but I have found that if you go to a garden store where that's what their specialty is and they're from the Pacific Northwest, they'll set you up on good fertilizers. And right now, <clears throat> what we're looking for in our lawns is that with the three numbers here for any fertilizer, it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, N, P, K. And that's any fertilizer bag will give you these three nutrients. Might have other nutrients in it, but they always will tell you what the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium um, uh, uh, numbers are. <clears throat> but we want this middle of the number to be a zero or a one. So for a balanced fertilizer like this one, where it says all purpose fertilizer, for roses or for vegetables and for flowers. We might need a little more phosphorus, right? This is more of a balance, but for lawns, we want a little bit higher nitrogen and a lot lower phosphorus. So for an organic fertilizer for lawns, it might be like an 802 or a 711 or something like that, but a little bit higher nitrogen, but a little bit, we want it to be a lower number for the phosphorus. The phosphorus is really causing a lot of problems in our water system, like our lakes and stuff with um, algae blooms and everything. So we wanna minimize any phosphorus that's being put out there. And a lot of products, especially these wheat and feeds and stuff, huge numbers in the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, numbers. Uh, so it really makes it so a lot of those nutrients are flowing off into our rivers and streams instead of taking care of our plants like we want them. So natural fertilizers, middle number is a zero or a one. And that's why, again, go to a good garden center because ask them for a lawn fertilizer, not just like a general all-purpose fertilizer. Okay, and then it really doesn't matter what kind of fertilizers you need, you use. We really need to make sure that after every application, we're cleaning up everything that gets on a hardscape, be it a driveway, sidewalk, patio, anything like that. That needs to be swept or blown off and then put onto the soil surface, into the lawn, so it can do what it needs to be. But even an organic fertilizer left all over the driveway with a, with a spring rain is gonna be carried off into our stormwater system. So we really wanna be careful with any spills or any overthrow and make sure that it goes back in the soil. And then you always follow product guidelines. They put a lot of information on those bags, but one of them is how much you put down per thousand square feet. I always recommend maybe put a little bit less than what they're recommending. And if you're not getting the result, put a little bit more, but you never wanna just go put more than what they say, thinking you're gonna get um, a better result. So most of the time, all we're gonna do is get it where those nutrients are gonna get washed away and then we're just wasting on water. So. With fertilizers, more is not better. Use a little bit less, see what happens, and then you can add a little bit more if you need to, okay? 
and then know what kind of fertilizer or know what kind of spreader you have, okay? There's two kinds of spreaders for fertilizers for logs. One is a broadcast spreader. That means it falls, the fertilizer falls out of little holes and there's a paddle that goes around. And so when that fertilizer hits the paddle, it gets thrown out, usually like about a three, four foot pattern that it gets thrown out around that, that spreader. But there's also drop spreaders, which is just a hopper fertilizer in it. When you open up the hopper, the fertilizer goes straight down. It doesn't get thrown, doesn't get broadcast. It just gets uh, dropped straight down between the two wheels. So this gentleman had a drop spreader thinking he had a broadcast spreader, right? So he did his pattern here, and then he went over here thinking that the fertilizer was gonna be thrown out on both sides on each way, same with this side, but yet it was just dropping it straight down on this. So big problem with way too much fertilizer there and not enough where, every, where, everywhere else where you want it. So for a lot of people, if you have like a broadcast, which I usually recommend because it gives you a little bit better pattern, um, on most lawns, especially if you're kind of new to it, you go one direction with half of your recommended rate, and then you go the other direction with the other half of recommended rate, and you will get a good full pattern with the right amount, okay? But know what kind of spreader you have also, okay? And then again, um, please, out of anything, if you can take anything from the talk tonight, is that we have to avoid anything that we call dual combination products. Weed and feed products, moss control plus fertilizer, all these things where they're adding one thing and another and saying, hey, just put it over the lawn is causing us big problems. As a matter of fact, I just heard a commercial for a product that said that it is a five in one uh, lawn product and they're just touting how easy it is. So it has a fertilizer in it. It has a broadleaf weed control in it like this weed feed, but it also has a broadleaf pre-emergent uh, weed control in it. It also has a crabgrass killer and then has a crabgrass pre-emergent, so trying not to grow crabgrass. Well, we don't have crabgrass around here. I'll talk about the weed grasses we have a little bit later, but we don't have crabgrasses. So anybody who's buying this product, it's called a five in one, and they said it was at Lowe's and Walmart, so please don't go buy this product. Um, a five in one, we're putting down poisons that are not needed in the Pacific Northwest. So no more weed killer plus fertilizer, no more moss control plus fertilizer. I'll talk about um, how you can control weeds and moss in, in a little bit later here, but just know that none of those things are possible to control without having your lawn thick and lush and vigorous growing. And that comes from proper mowing, watering, and using organic fertilizers in order to thicken up your lawn. And then you start working on your weeds. But if your lawn's not happy, if your soil's not good and you try to kill your weeds right now, they will come back with a vengeance because nothing's there to take their place. Okay, so no more weed and feed, please. No more dual products. Um, and I do recommend lime application. Lime is just calcium. Dolomite lime, like this says here, is calcium and magnesium, both natural occurring elements that our soils get leached of with our rain. So the rain comes through and pulls these minerals from our soil profile out of that soil profile. And in turn, that makes our soils acidic around here. So by adding this lime, it brings the soil back up to a favorable range. And they call it the power of hydrogen, pH. And what it is is that around here, we don't want to let the pH for our lawns get much below a six, okay, or get below about a six. The really their wheelhouse is about six to about 6.7 is where lawns want to be around here. And if we have that and we have the nutrition available, it's in, uh, uh, available in abundance for the plants. But as the soils get more acidic, and it happens in the Pacific Northwest where we've seen soils five, something like, you know, really, really low around here. Um, what happens is that even though the nutrition or those minerals might be available for plant use, because it's a low pH, chemically, the plants can't absorb those, those nutrients. So they become unavailable for the plant, even though they're in the soil. Okay, so a lot of people, if the soil's looking a little peak or if the plants are looking a little peak, it will over fertilize trying to get the lawn to grow and it still won't do anything because the pH is too low. Okay, so we want to get the pH into a favorable range and keep it there. A lot of times that means doing a soil test. So I'm up, I'm up here in uh, uh, Bothell, which is, you know, a little north of Seattle. And so there's a company, um, Simply Soil Testing in Burlington, that does fantastic soil testing for like $15 or $20. Tell you organic matter, nutrition, pH, but also give you recommendations to make it better. So if you think you have low pH, do a soil test. And they'll also give you recommendations on what to do in order to get it back into a favorable range, okay? 
And then even though these are like the cutest thing that ever walked the, the surface of the earth and stuff like that, and absolutely adorable, what comes out the back end is not organic fertilizer. Okay, so it needs to be treated as solid waste. It, need, it cannot be composted. Please do not compost it at home. Please do not dig holes in the yard and bury it at home. Please do not put it in yard waste to be taken off with the composting facilities. It needs to be treated as solid waste. So it's cleaned up as soon as possible, put into a bag and then put into the regular garbage. But please, it is not yard waste and is not organic fertilizer. So it needs to be treated um, as solid waste. And there's a lot of things in the poos of these animals that can also be washed off um, in that fecal matter into our rivers and streams and stuff. So really being uh, uh, timely on our cleanup and stuff like that is very important too by having animals. Just Part of being a responsible animal owner okay so number one was mowing number two is fertilizing so number two we want to use natural organic fertilizers uh, or slow release no more weed and feed products and we also want to add a little lime maybe once a year um, there's some videos about the mowing and the fertilizing and even watering um, on those links from the city of olympia and stuff like that so there's a lot of great information just about that and aeration so check out those videos too for some more information but watering really is going to be a big key for us. Like even right now, March and April, we are behind on our rainfall coming down. Even though it's been a fantastic springtime, it also starts making us, make us a little aware that, you know, we need that spring rain and also to be able to get through our summer months. So in order to do it right, and I have a lot of people, they always ask, you know, uh, how long should I water? And I, I just can't tell them a number. I can't say 10 minutes, 15 minutes, one minute, because I don't know what their sprinkler system does. I don't know what kind of soil they have. I don't know the health of their grass plant. I don't know the depth of their root system. So there's a lot of things that has to be known in order to be able to water correctly. But the number one thing that everyone can do in order to get off on the right foot is to measure what your irrigation output is in order to be able to do it um, responsibly. So what we're looking for in lawns is one inch is the magic number. One inch is what we're looking for in our water output, okay? And so that would mean for like me, I went out and I had the, these cans, you know, like this tuna fish cans, you can use anything that's kind of the same, um, uh, the same consistency. Like my, when my wife wasn't home, I used all our good china because that was all the same sizes. So I put it all over the lawn. You run your sprinkler for a certain amount of time. As a matter of fact, um, I got an oscillator and that's kind of what this one is. And I love oscillators. Oscillator sprinklers for me, they go and they water one side. And when they go to water the other side, the water's allowed to sink in slowly on that one side. So I can get really good deep watering with my oscillator, but it takes quite a while to collect my water. So when I did mine at home and I measured it out, and that's what you'll do. You'll water for a certain amount of time, pick you know, 15 minutes, half hour, pick a certain amount of time. You go out and you measure and you get a medium, right? So you try to get like a, a middle range, what your sprinkler did on all these cups. And then that, you can do a simple calculation on how much time then it takes you to get your one inch. So like for me, it took me two hours of watering to get one inch, okay? And again, that's just my house. That's just my water pressure. That's just my sprinkler. So everyone has to do their own, but you'll go out and you measure it, figure what, what it is to get your one inch. And that is your, your magic number on how much you would water if we don't have any rain come out of the sky and it's dry, okay, for that one inch. And again, every sprinkler system has different outputs. My oscillator, like I told you, two hours to get one inch of water. Where I've seen these little pop-up heads, like if they have one at each corner and one in the middle, like on some lawns, it could take like literally a minute and a half for that water to be coming out so fast that the water's starting to run off and you have more than one inch. So every system is different and that's why you, all, you have to do your own, okay? And know too that if we can put that one inch of water down one day a week, okay? So we don't wanna water every single day, a little bit of water. What happens is the roots don't grow down because they're just, they have what they need right at the top. Even if we water like twice a week, the roots will be a little bit deeper, but they're really kind of a little more shallower than we would like to see. If you water that one inch, one day a week, and you have, let's say six inches of good soil, and that's why you really need to know what's going on under, underneath your lawn. But if you have six inches of soil, good soil, and you put that one inch of water down, it'll actually, that one inch, fill up all six inches of that soil. And then as the soil dries out a little bit later during 
this the, the, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever the rest of the week is and stuff like that, the grass roots will actually grow down in the soil, finding that water, and you can train your roots to get deeper. Deeper roots mean a better plant on top. And this is proof right here. This is a lawn that we help take care of. And the roots are nine inches deep on this lawn. Look how thick and tenacious and green this lawn is. It grows so well because it has a good soil system, has a good root system, and has moisture that it can pull from as it needs. That is a lawn that is thriving. This is a grass plant that somehow is surviving on our caliche clay with no soil and no roots barely, but look at it. It's still got some green growth. It's still somehow eking out a living. You know what? You do not want a lawn like this. You don't want a lawn that's just struggling to get by. You want a lawn that is loving life and thriving. That comes from good soil, good root systems, and good water practices, okay? And that's why I recommend for everybody, if you want to really get into this and understand what's going on down below the soil surface, get yourself a soil probe, okay? This is one of the best tools for understanding what's going on below the soil surface. So you can just put it into the ground, pull it back up. You can see um, through here, like how deep your roots are going down, how far you water. So I do this all the time. I water my yard, use my soil probe, and I'll go, oh, I watered down for three inches. I can water down a couple more inches. I'll add a little bit more water to drive that soil profile down. But get yourself a soil probe the best tool for understanding what's going on underneath the soil for your vegetables, for your, your flowers, whatever you're growing, to see how good the soil is, how good your roots, is, roots are, and also how good your watering practices are going on. So get yourself a good one. This one costs about $80, so it's a pricey little tool, but it'll last you a lifetime, and you'll get a good understanding on what you're doing and how it's making um, the rest of your landscape work, okay? So I really recommend your soil probe. Um, and then, you know, grass plants, if we don't water them or if they don't get moisture, they'll actually go into a dormant state. And they're the only plant that we know that will do that. All other plants, if they don't have enough water, they will actually just get to a point, they just die. But grass plants will actually go into this dormant state when they don't have moisture in their root systems. And they'll stay there until fall time. And the things that will trigger them are shorter days, cooler weather, and, and moisture, okay? So if your lawn's starting to go dormant now because we've had some warm weather and you water and water and water, it'll never come out of dormancy until fall time because the plant's not go in and out. It's not gonna go in and out, in and out of dormancy. It goes into it once, waits for the fall time, okay? But lawns can go golden, which is an environmental thing to do if you don't wanna water your lawn. But yet a couple of things you need to understand about that. One is that if you're going to do this, you need to have a healthy lawn going into that. So you need to mow right, fertilize correctly, really build up the healthier lawn. So when it goes into that dormancy, it's healthy and it comes out a lot healthier. And then because the grass plant is in this state of not having moisture, so the moisture doesn't give it resiliency, doesn't give it toughness, it's a delicate state. So if you're going to have a lot of action, picnics and, and soccer games or whatever it is, all of your lawn in this dormant lawn, you'll actually be killing and and uh, destroying your crowns and your grass plants, and you'll have major renovation work to do in the fall time. So if you're gonna have that kind of activity on your lawn um, during the summer months, you need to keep moisture on it so the lawn's growing. It needs to have moisture for that toughness and resiliency. And if you're gonna let it go golden, um, and we're getting into periods like right now where March was dry, April was dry, and we get in where it's gonna be drier for the next couple months, to so just water once a month just one inch of water once a month, just keeping some moisture in that soil profile is huge for the lawn recovering quicker in fall time, okay? And we'll see it all the time that as soon as things start getting warm, as soon as things start drying out, like two or three weeks of dry weather, because of our really heavy clay soils, they go from sloppy wet to completely dry within a week or so. And the lawn will start turning this golden color, this straw color, when it doesn't have moisture in its root system. Now you can see down here in the rest of the lawn where it's green and even underneath this tree where it's a lot happier because it has a uh, filtered sun, but moisture runs downhill. So it's kind of slopey here. So moisture, a small amount of moisture difference from here to here. You can see the lawn starting to work its way down as that moisture starts, um, it loses that moisture in the soil profile, okay? And again, it can do this golden work for 
six to eight weeks and be just fine. But what we're finding that right now, our summers and our springs are getting drier and a little bit longer and a little more heat intensive. So if we're gonna go longer than six to eight weeks with not much uh, moisture, the lawns we're seeing now are thinning out. And if they're thinning out, that means you're gonna have weeds and you're gonna have moss in your yard, okay? So if you don't want weeds, if you don't, or you want minimum weeds, if you want minimum moss, you're gonna to have to water uh, responsibly through the summer months to keep your lawn growing, okay? If it goes dormant, that's when these other critters will move in, okay? So water deeply, water infrequently, check your soil profile, really get yourself a soil probe to really see how that moisture is doing um, uh, and become a responsible water user. So there's a really good pamphlet too, Smart Watering, that's on uh, uh, the links that they gave you. Some really good information, again, kind of the same things I went over, but uh, even more so like talking about drip uh, irrigation and soaker hoses and, and automatic sprinklers and stuff like that. So really good information about more about watering in that. And then really for lawns, culturally, one of the best things we can do as a physical practice is improve the lawns through an, uh, an action called aeration, and then we overseed, and then we top dress. And this lawn aeration, um, because it opens up soil, uh, the soil profile, it re remove compaction and also open up uh, the profile for air movement and stuff like that. So we like to do it in spring, like right now, April, May, first part of June is perfect aeration time. The next season would be September, October. We wanna do it when the lawn's growing, when it's happy and stuff like that, because it is a physical action, a physical beating up of the lawn. So we want, want the lawn to be able to grow to move out of that. So we never recommend aerations in summer or winter. This is a spring or fall activity. And you also wanna get yourself a, a, a hollow tine aerator like this one. They do have what they call solid tines. So that's like a big piece of metal, but when it rams itself into the soil, it compacts the soil while it's pushing all that soil to the side. So. You want a hollow tine because as these move to the soil, they actually pull little plugs and put them on top of the soil surface. And that's the look that we're looking for. Now, if you do it really well, you'll see these little plugs all over. And it almost looks like a goose convention all over your lawn, right? But it's a good sign that you're doing the right job when you're pulling out physically these little plugs and then laying them on top of the soil surface. And what they found by physically removing this little plug we get air exchange, we get gas exchange back. It's like the lawn's breathing again. We get more moisture going in there. We get more nutrition. If you want to fertilize or put your lime down right now, go straight into the soil profile instead of having to move to the soil profile. So tons of advantages of doing this aeration. And they have found too that even if you have a bad thatch layer, and thatch layers are just um, a sign of improper fertilizing and watering where every grass um, community has this little layer of thatch and all it is is like a transition zone with between the root system and the crowns growing up and stuff but if it's uh, it starts getting too thick it really makes it tough for the roots to grow in this because it's not soil it's just old dead plants so um, if you have a thatch problem I do not recommend thatching it all out use an aerator they have shown that even with a bad thatch problem run the aerator drive that aerator through that thatch into the soil profile you get more water you get more nutrients, you get more oxygen down in there, and then you get a better root system. So it's amazing what an aeration will do for lawns, even poor ones with a bad thatch layer, beat the heck out of it with an aerator, okay? And then while you have that soil opened up, we recommend throwing seed down. It's called overseeding, and it's literally just throwing seed over the existing lawn. If you have your lawns going pretty good, you can put four to five pounds per thousand square feet, if your lawn's thin and stuff like that, you can up it to six, seven, even almost 10 pounds per thousand square feet to really thicken up the lawn. And again, the best times to do this are the best times to aerate, April through mid-June, September through mid-October. If you're going to be seeding in springtime, if you're gonna say, yes, I'm seeding in springtime, you have to water your grass through the summer. The lawns will go into that dormant state and go into that um, golden state once they're established, but it takes them a year to get established. So if you have a brand new lawn, brand new seedlings, you cannot let it go into that dormant state. You have to water throughout the summer, get the lawn uh, um, uh, established. And then in the future, if you want to, you can let it go dormant or it can go dormant. But if you're gonna seed and then not water this year, then you're gonna waste all that money on your seed, okay? And again, the grasses that we use, perennial ryegrasses and fine fescues are really the two that do the best in our, in our environment. 
Um, some grasses that they sell, like at the big box stores, they have uh, bluegrass in it, zoysia grass, all these other different grasses. They don't work here. They all die off because of our unique Northwest weather. So most grasses you want to buy, grass seed, you want to buy from your local nursery. Again, go there, talk to them. They'll probably give you one that says sun and shade blend. It might say Pacific Northwest blend, but it'll be two or three different kinds of perennial rise and two or three different kinds of fescues. And you can't tell them apart. They all look the same, but as a blend, they do good in our dry areas and our, in our soggy areas in our really hot areas, in our dappled shade areas and stuff like that. So they do good in all of our lawn conditions and that's why you wanna use these grasses. And just know too, that even though it says sun and shade, no grass grows really well in shade. So we never can grow really good lawn under cedar trees, fir trees, anything like that. Anything where the branches are low, where the sun can't get to it, they won't do very good. They mean sun and shade like a uh, uh, deciduous tree, like a maple tree where it gets dappled shade, gets dappled sunshine, they'll do good in that, but they will not do good just in shade, okay? And then again, if you can, you open up your soil profile, you put some seed down, they'll thicken up the lawn. If you can put a small layer, like literally a quarter inch of good compost over your lawn into those holes on top of your seed, your lawn will explode for you, okay? It's called top dressing. And again, it's kind of pretty easy to do. Just physically, you take your shovel, throw out some piles, rake it back and forth this way, rake it back and forth this way. Again, we don't want to bury the lawn. We want to see the grass afterwards. It's just about a quarter inch thick is all you need. Just enough to fill holes and cover seed, okay? But, um, and it takes a very minimal amount of this product to do it a quarter inch. So you don't need to use overuse this product or you're just burying your grass plants. You won't get the results that you're looking for. And what we've, another product that we're really excited about is this Axis DE, Diatomaceous Earth. I get it up in our area from Hendricus uh, Organics. <clears throat> but since it's Diatomaceous Earth and it's these shells, what well, we have found that if we can aerate and then we can rake this into the holes, it makes our soggy soils um, better where the water can move through them and makes our really dry hard pan soils stay open up so the water can get in there and break down those soils. So fantastic, like dual um, product. It makes soggy soils better, it makes dry soils better by allowing that soil structure to stay uh, content all the time with these, with, these, um, uh, with these shells. So if you're having problems with poor drainage or if you're having problems where your lawn dries out way too fast, it might be something to think about by aerating really heavy and then raking in this diatomaceous earth, Axis DE, you can look it up. And this is what it looks like. It looks like kitty litter, but it's actually really fine shells that, that once they get into that soil profile, they never break down. So it allows water always to move through, allows air always to move through. So fantastic product. We're really happy with the results. Okay, so mowing, fertilizing, watering, aeration, overseed top dressing, which is a cultural practice that can be done in either spring or fall. We recommend aeration once a year. Overseeding, if the lawn's thick, you might have to do it every couple years. And if you can top dress every year, just put a little bit of compost. We're replenishing that organic matter that the lawn needs. And we're also renewing the life that the soil needs in order to be successful. So we constantly want to add organic matter to our soils through our grass clippings. If we can mulch mow, our organic fertilizers, which is feeding the soil instead of the, um, just going straight to the plant and then using a little bit of compost to improve our soils. Okay. But really the whole key about it too, is that if we can have a nice lawn, then we don't have to use a bunch of the pesticides in order to try to kill things that we think that we're having problems with. So natural lawn care means, number one, no more weed and feed products. Please, no more of those poisons, plus a fertilizer. You're going to fertilize, her with, you're going to fertilize with a natural, slow-release fertilizer. And I'll talk about your weed control here in a little bit, but no more of these dual products. Because any of those products, they actually kill the soil organisms, um, uh, like the bacteria and the funguses and the protozoas and everything. And that damage that they do to those organisms makes our soils left, uh, have less life and makes them worse for uh, being a filter for any pollutants to go through them. So we never wanna damage those little critters by using those poisons. We're gonna crowd out weeds by a healthy lawn. Vigorous growing, tenacious, thick lawn is your number one weed control, your number one moss control. And you're gonna have to accept a few weeds because mother nature is always throwing plants in there. So. Um, you'll never have a completely weed-free lawn. Even people who use all the weed and feed products and all the sprays still always have weeds coming in because that's how Mother Nature works. So we want to outcompete her 
and try to reduce those by having a good lawn, but just accept a few as if we can, and then also removing them by hand or having the spot sprays, the two ways to get rid of weeds. And our big challenge with a lot of these products is that we're seeing um, off target problems with family, friends, pets, uh, children, the environment, all these things that we don't see. So up in Clearview, which is right up here in, in Snohomish, this veterinarian said pets don't mix well with lawn care products. And he told me that he had pets come in there with fur coming out, with lesions, with rashes, all these problems, because they're the ones rolling around in it, and licking it off themselves and stuff like that. When we just want a green lawn and we're putting all these poisons out there to try to make the lawn look a certain way. And then we're impacting these other, uh, these other critters and some of them that we really love. So we want to minimize or reduce or eliminate, if we can, any of those pesticides. Because this is another thing they found. In King County, they did a study, the USGS, where they went out and studied the, um, the waterways <clears throat> um, after a spring rain to see what kind of pesticides were flowing. And they look over here, they found 23 different pesticides in our waterways, including in the top four here, which were, means they are found in 100% of every river, tributary, stream, lake, Puget Sound, were the big weed and feed products. 2,4-D, MCPP are the weed and feed products. So we want to cut those out immediately to reduce that. Even some of these insecticides, trying to kill insects, diazinon was on their list. That's now been removed from our ability to buy in stores because of the problems they were seeing with diazinon because of the uh, misuse of that product. So we don't wanna use those products because we have so many off-target problems. So if you're going to use any products, though, I recommend this GrowSmart, GrowSafe.org website. Gives you fantastic information um, in order to make an informed decision on any product that you want to use on your yard. It doesn't matter if it's organic. doesn't matter if it's synthetic. Use this guide to really give you information so you can make sure you're informed to make the best buying decision and then the best um, application decisions that you can. And it'll give you tons of information about natural controls, and even the ones that aren't um, natural, more um, uh, chemical made and stuff like that. And they will give you um, all these great uh, uh, signals on whether these plant, whether these products have problems with human uh, contact, pet and wildlife, aquatic life, water pollution. And they have some that are really, really bad that we do not want to use. So look up the products with this website, grow smart, grow safe. Um, and make an informed decision on any product that you want to use, okay? But if you do decide to use an herbicide, you're saying, okay, I'm going to use a plant killer, and that's what the herbicides are, um, is a plant killer. You always use them as a last resort, right? So do not try to start killing your weeds if your lawn's not healthy or the weeds will just come back. You always select the proper product for the job. We have pre-emergence, post-emergence, we have non-selectives, we have selectives, we have so many different killers in horticulture and all these herbicides. If you don't know what you're using, you can have big problems. And that's why you need to read the label, you need to read the label, and then you re need to read the label in order to understand what you're using and what's the best time and um, place to use that product for the results that you're looking for. And they'll always tell you what you need to wear as proper uh, protective clothing, PPE. Uh, we've heard a lot about PPP, PPE because of this pandemic, but really even for applying these products, they'll probably tell you wear rubber boots, Rubber gloves, long pants, long sleeves, um, shirts, probably wear a respirator or have to wear a, a, a face shield or something like that, but protect yourself by using any of these products. And that's what the label will tell you. And then make sure you always use them properly for timing. If you spray right before a rainstorm when you're not supposed to, then all that product gets washed away. So always use product timing, proper timing, and that'll be on the label too. And then you always spray with care. And a quick story here, I had some friends who live in uh, Winthrop, but they also have a house, or they live in Seattle, but also have a house in Winthrop. And Winthrop, they have some noxious weeds that they have to use um, and have to keep under control by state law. So they use uh, uh, glyphosate, um, glyphosate, uh, Roundup is one of the um, trade names. So they had some of that over there and the husband said, I'm gonna use that to kill my dandelions in my lawn in Seattle. And my friend was saying, hey, that's a non-selective post-emergent herbicide. It doesn't care, good plant, bad plant, whatever it gets on, it kills. And he said, you know what? I'm really good at target practice. So he went and got the product, brought it back, and this is what he did to their lawn. And not only that, he had some extra and he did it to the neighbor's lawns to try to be a good guy 
but anywhere he sprayed with it, not only did the dandelion die, but any grass that was around it, because that's what this product does. And visually, we can see that and go, uh-oh, something's wrong here. This is not right. The problem with most of those products, like those 23 pesticides in the rivers and streams, is that we can't see them. You just see water flowing, but all those products are there. So we always want to be as careful as possible. And if we can, just not use them at all. Okay? So... Let me talk about weeds for a couple minutes and I'll talk about moss and moles, okay? But really weeds, um, dandelions, sign of compacted soils. Mother, Mother Nature throws these little dandelions out there to break up hard pan soils. And then when they die off, they add calcium to the soil. So they're almost like a natural lining to the soils. So that when the next plants come in, they have better soils to grow in. So um, if you have a better lawn, you'll have less dandelions just because the lawn is able to outcompete them. Now you'll never get rid of dandelions, but you can reduce them and dig them out by hand. They're the easiest ones to dig out by hand by just using like a good hori hori uh, garden tools, okay? Someone had asked about clover earlier and I already mentioned that it's a nitrogen fixer. That means that it brings nitrogen from the atmosphere and brings it down into the soil and then shares it with all its friends. So it was actually sold in lawn mixtures before the herbicide company said, you know what, any broadleaf plant in a, with a grass plant is a bad plant, so you need to kill it. They also did a marketing campaign say, hey, clover brings bees. Bees have stingers. Stingers can kill you, um, so you don't want any bees or any clover in your lawn. And that's a, that's, a, that's a nasty message because we need to take care of our bees now. And bees love clover. I love clover honey and stuff like that. So clover is a fantastic plant. So I recommend leaving it in the lawns. I like leaving it in the lawns. The lawns will stay greener. They won't go dormant as quick because they're having clover and they'll, um, uh, they'll uh, <clears throat> just grow better by having this nitrogen um, uh, replenishment through this clover, giving it with the nitrogen, being a nitrogen fixer. So the only way to get rid of what we call creepers like clover or um, a, a buttercup would be to spray it with an herbicide. There's no way you're gonna dig this out by hand like you can do a dandelion. You would have to use an herbicide, a broadleaf selective herbicide to spray it. I recommend just leave it, you know what I mean? If you're, the flowers are a challenge, just mow more often during the springtime when they're flowering and then um, it's not so much of a problem. But really, if you have clover in your lawn, I say leave it. If you don't want it, you're gonna to have to spray it and that becomes a challenge, okay? So the only two ways to get rid of weeds, hand pull, like with the tap-rooted ones, dandelions, uh, plantains, anything like that, you can pop out by hand. Anything that is a creeper, like uh, clover or buttercup, if you wanna get rid of it, you might, you're gonna have to spray selectively in that spot for the clover. Just don't put something all over the lawn to kill it off. That's why I recommend just leaving it and, and accepting it as being part of a natural lawn, okay? Also mentioned earlier, we do not have crabgrass. Please do not buy crabgrass killers. We have wheat grasses. We have grasses like this little poa annua that right now has little seed heads all over and drives people crazy because it just has a different color. We also have grasses that grow this way, like they grow horizontally. They don't grow straight up. And so they just look ratty and, and worse, but they're grass plants, which means nothing's going to kill them. That's not going to kill your desirable grass. So a lot of it is if you're fertilizing with organic fertilizers, you can keep your greenness up so that you can mask the different color of them. And by keeping your lawn mowed regularly, they don't get where they just look a lot different. But if some of these um, grasses get in there, very difficult to get rid of. Um, even digging them up, if you leave a little bit of a root, it'll come back from that. So it becomes more of a management system through mowing and fertilizing to mask that you have these uh, weed grasses in there. And every lawn has some of these grasses in them, every single lawn, okay? So let me finish off here with moss and moles and then we'll take some questions. Um, moss though is a tenacious plant. The reason that we have it is that we live in a rainforest. Like if you go to the whole river over there, moss grows on everything, on trees, on logs, on rocks, on moss. I mean, on, it probably grows on moss too, but it grows on ferns, everything because it's mother nature's big sponge. When water comes out of the sky, it's so heavily, it soaks it all up to the moss and then slowly releases it to the environment. So in Mother Nature's world, in the Pacific Northwest, West, it's a tenacious plant that she is using to protect her environment, but for us, it drives us crazy. But you should know that anywhere where other plants aren't successful, um, or if like acidic soils and stuff like that, moss will become a dominant plant because that's what it's supposed to do 
cover up the soil to protect it. So under big, heavy, sh shady evergreens, big slopey areas where lawn is not going to be successful, moss is probably going to be the most successful plant. Okay. And you usually go out in springtime and you go, oh, I got a little bit of moss in my lawn. And then you'll go, wait, I got some more moss and I have a little bit of lawn. And you'll go, oh my gosh, I've got little bits of lawn in all my moss. And a lot of that is because it really does become a tenacious plant during the winter time when the lawn is kind of dormant and the moss moves in, okay? So if you want to get rid of it, I'm going to teach you how to get rid of it now. <clears throat> um, you're going to have to do these steps though in order to get rid of it or it'll constantly be a problem for you, okay? So first of all, you can treat it and there's some products like this that are made from iron, like this one says 7% iron. This also says kills lawn moss quickly, which is untrue. Nothing kills moss in these products. What this iron does is it dehydrates it by being a heavy salt and it sucks the moisture out of the, the moss and turns it black. And if people put it down, they'll have green. You can see the moss in here in the lawn. But once you put the product down, it's turning the moss black by removing the moisture from the, the, the moss and weakening the moss. But it's not killing it, it's weakening it. So while it's in this weakened state, you want to remove it physically. You physically have to remove it and get it out of there. And I found that if people use rakes or something like that, you'll remove the part that's blackened because it's weakened, but it's not getting out all the moss that's still down below that. In order to do that, you need to rent a thatching machine, okay? You can rent these at the same place you get uh, aerating machines and all these other pieces of equipment from, for home use and stuff like that. But this thatching machine has all these tines underneath there in a bar that when it's running, they're going around really fast. And then this bar back here allows you to put this uh, deck right onto your soil profile. And so when you're going over your lawn, you're going to be pulling up all this moss because it is on that soil profile and you need to rip it up off of that soil, big, huge, thick pieces of moss everywhere. Then you rake all that up and then you remove it. But because you did this, you have really beat up your lawn. You're gonna have thin areas, you're gonna have bare areas. You have to come back and aerate. You have to come back and overseed. And instead of overseeding, you're gonna have to reseed. That means you're probably have to put down probably 10 pounds per thousand square feet instead of your four to five pounds. You really wanna put it down thick and then you will have to top dress. Because if you have seed down here in big, big bare areas, and it, it gets wet, it starts germinating, and then it gets dry, it'll die off. So this compost has to be put on top of the seed to help protect it while it germinates um, and establishes itself. But if you do it right and you remove all that moss, you aerate seed top dress, the lawn will actually turn out beautiful. It really comes back strong and thickens itself up with good watering after that, okay? And again, if you're gonna do all this, you will have to water the entire summer into next year to make sure that lawn gets established, okay? And then afterwards, you're gonna have to mow right, fertilize, water correctly, and aerate, overseed, and top dress every year to keep the lawn healthy and happy, or it will come back. You're also gonna have to lime once a year to keep that pH in a favorable range, or the moss will come back, okay? Or sometimes tolerance is the best thing. Underneath big cedar trees where it's really thick, let the moss take over, put a couple shrunken heads, maybe some sword ferns and bleeding hearts, hellebores. There's fantastic garden shade plants we have around here that makes beautiful gardens instead of trying to grow lawn where it doesn't want to be. I even found this, a garden mat made with different kinds of mosses that um, gives your feet a little reflexology when you come out of the garden, uh, coming out of the shower. You'll never wash another bath, bath mat and always have happy little feet, okay? Or like this gentleman here, in complete tolerance of all the moss growing around him. And you should know, just like this guy, he was completely naked when he went out into the garden. So anywhere that's shady, moss will grow if you sit there long enough, okay? So sometimes being in Zen means uh, it's growing on you too, okay? I'm gonna finish up here with moles because that's a big challenge for us up here too. We have two moles, the Townsend and the Pacific. And these little critters are fantastic, fantastic again for the Pacific Northwest for turning our soils over and bringing soils down and bringing them up and stuff like that. So Mother Nature loves to have moles around here for just this soil mixing and stuff like that. And they can move pretty good, 15 feet per hour in good soil. And that's the equivalent of like a 150 pound person moving 4,800 pounds. They are tenacious little critters 
um, for what they do. And really like, you know, we can mow one night and come out the next day and just have huge mow holes all over the place because in good soil, they really can do a lot of, uh, a lot of digging. <clears throat> and this is probably what we want to do to them, right, man? So it's like, you get a hold of these little critters, maybe make some slippers out of them. I actually found these on the internet, little mole slippers. Uh, but most people want to get rid of them. And so they've used like these little um, vibrating things. Maybe they work. They've used this, uh, uh, it's made from castor oil, this mole max. It's supposed to make the soil taste bad so they don't want to be around. Um, but really the only two things that we have really found that have been very successful is one is coyote urine. And I've had a couple customers buy this. They make it synthetically now and it smells terrible, but it's a predator. So when they pour it on the mole mounds, the most think there's a predator around and they will move out of that area quickly. Um, so you can buy it, you can put it down, smells pretty bad, but it will get rid of them. They also sell hardware cloth and that's a product you can get at any hardware store. It's like a really heavy duty, like chicken wire. And they use this on the side of houses to put like the fake rocks and bricks and everything on to stick them to the houses. But with this hardware cloth, what you can do is unroll it. You put it into an L shape. You dig a trench in your yard where the moles are coming from. And they're usually coming from natural areas back and forth. What they do is they dig tunnels. They don't kill grass plant roots. What they're doing is when they dig their tunnels, um, uh, earthworms and grubs and stuff like that fall into the tunnels and then they, the, the moles come back through and they eat all those little critters. So that's what they're doing is always patrolling their, their tunnels. So if you can dig this trench and put the hardware cloth between you and them so that the L part, oops, excuse me, the L part is pointing where they're coming from. They'll hit this, think that it's a rock, try to go underneath it, and then think it's a rock, and then they just go back from where they came from. So as a physical barrier, 100% barrier, control by keeping moles out by using hardware cloth in a trench, okay? But for me, that's a lot of work too. So I just literally at my house, I take a shovel, take some of the soil and throw it out here, and I just take a rake and shovel it, you know, just rake it all out. Usually there's just like one small hole right here in the middle, and as long as you can get this soil before it cakes down and just kind of kick it out, surround the, the other area with good soil, you really won't notice these guys very much, but it does take a little bit of maintenance, okay? So uh, mowing, fertilizing, watering, aeration over seed top dress, thinking twice before you use any pesticides, moss and moles. The last thing is that if your lawn is still driving you crazy, maybe we rethink the lawn. Because if it's not functional, if it's not doing anything good for us, do something different that is going to do something good for you, okay? I live um, up in Lake Stevens and actually saw this lawn driving around the lake where it had smoke, had fire coming out of the lawn, and it was this gentleman's roof. And so this is a functional lawn for him. He doesn't have a yard, but yet he wanted the lawn to be able to go up and watch the fireworks and watch the boats do their thing. Um, it's all natural. You can see there's broadleaf plants growing in here, but it is a functional lawn for him, and that's what we need to do. But if it's not, what's the point? They just, I saw this in a development, little teeny things. Of, this is 18 inches by four feet, and it's like, who's going to mow that? Who's going to aerate that? Who's going to water that? I mean, all this by just having a little green patch that's going to die off and have weeds and everything in it just become a nuisance. Don't put lawns where lawn's not supposed to be. And if you have an existing lawn that's non-functional because it just sits there and not enough room for like, you know, sporting or anything else you want to do, get rid of it. Plant a garden, plant vegetables, plant flowers, plant something that brings life to your gardens instead of just having lawns. Because when we do it right and we can plant stuff like this, everyone is successful. Children, the environment, mother nature, we can grow a little food and, and give it to each other, okay? Because the ultimate goal of natural lawn care is not spending all your time on your lawn. It's being able to enjoy your garden. And that's the main thing. So if you do it right, you'll have the lawn you're really, really looking for. And not only that, you'll be having a, a lawn that's safe for our families, pets, and good for the environment. Okay. So that is the talk. I will stop sharing so we can take some questions. Kind of went through that pretty quick. Again, there's Fantastic information, the growing healthy soils. I didn't mention that one, but there's the natural lawn care pamphlet, the smart watering pamphlet. There's tremendous amounts of, of information available on top of all this, including those videos from the city of the Olympia that you can help you through your natural yard care adventures. Question, Rachel one or Rachel two? 
Yeah, we have some questions. So we'll jump right into questions. Um, cool. <clears throat> first question is, do you have to aerate before overseeding? No, you can aerate by itself. You can overseed by itself. You can even top dress by itself. But if you can aerate and get some seed down into those holes also, you'll get a thicker lawn. So um, each one kind of makes it makes the other ones better. So you can do one or the other, or if you do one or two or do all three, you'll have a better lawn because of doing each additional practice. All right, Margo would like to know, can you top dress with something like Tagro? So if I remember correctly, down in Tacoma, Tagro is a product that you guys produce. I think it would work. I mean, as long as what we're looking for is a finer material. <clears throat> so not like a mulch, not like a chunky compost that's going to be going over the lawn just because it's a, a finer plant. So as long as the material is uh, a finer material, I would think that the Tagro would be able to be able to work just fine. Walt, do you have an opinion? Uh, this is Walt. I, I have used it as, as a top dress and it works great. Perfect. It, it yep. has a little bit of smell for about a week. So just so you know, it smells a little bit, but then that'll go away. But rake it in, water it in, rake it in. Works. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much, Walt. I discovered Tagro this year and it's pretty cool. Walt, do you want to say a little bit about Tagro in our area and where you can get it? Sure. Yes, uh, it, Tagro is produced by the city of Tacoma. If you go uh, to the Tagro website, you will find all the information about it. It's produced down on the Tide Flats. You can either order it by a truck load or you know by a yard or two or they will deliver, or you can actually go down and pick it up for free down at the Tagro uh, factory down there too. So check it out, just, uh, just go Tagro. Thank you. Uh, all right, so um, let's see, how many times a year should you fertilize and what kind of compost should you spread? Great questions. <clears throat> well, up here we have Cedar Grove compost. So I really like that. Again, it's kind of like the tag row down there where it's a locally produced product. And so we're just kind of closing that recycling loop by using that. So if you're not gonna use tag row, I would recommend going again to your local nursery and asking them for a good compost. And again, the whole key is using a fine compost so that it covers up the seed and gets down in those holes so it's not a chunky thing, but they'll be able to help you out with that. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? Compost and? Uh, how often to fertilize. Oh, how often to fertilize. So that's kind of a one that's dependent on, it's a, it's a really tough, it's kind of like watering. It's really difficult to just say once, twice, five times or something like that. It depends if you're mulch mowing, depends on the health of your lawn, depends on the uh, soil depth that you're going. We found that on some urban environments, um, because the soil is very shallow, that you that people need to fertilize a little more often, but with a lot less fertilizer, right? So it's gonna last a little bit longer. You need to put out a little bit more, but as we build our soil profiles, we can use less and less fertilizer because the plant's better able to use it and in that soil profile. <clears throat> so for most in the natural yard care program, we usually recommend twice a year um, if you're mulch mowing. That would be like May, June. And then the most important one is like October, September, October, November, when we get into that fall winterizer time. Um, but if lawns are struggling, they might need a couple more uh, fertilizations on lower amounts just to keep the nutrition going. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, Caleb has chickweed and chickweed is creeping all over and killing the lawn. Is there an effective way to deal with it? So I've found chickweed will be less of a, I won't say it won't be a problem, but less of a problem is the lawn's grown taller. It likes to really kind of hang out that soil surface, but it is one of those broad leaves that if people want to get rid of, they're going to use, have to use a selective herbicide for it. <clears throat> so it's almost becomes more of a tolerance thing and trying to outgrow it. Um, but it, it's a very tenacious broadleaf plant. So it uh, um, becomes that decision-making on whether they want to just try to live with it or whether they just need to get rid of it because it's driving them crazy. Uh, all right, so similar question. Uh, what about Creeping Charlie? 
Creeping Charlie. Well, you know, that's an ornamental plant, right? <clears throat> what I have found uh, in some landscapes is that there's like that, there's a juga, there's a couple of these other uh, ground covers that they look great in our garden beds, but as soon as they cross that line from garden bed into lawn, now they're a weed, right? So it's just like, I love my Creeping Charlie there, but I hate it over there. So the Creeping Charlie's coming from somewhere. If it's in a garden bed, then that has to become the decision-making process on whether you want to keep the Creeping Charlie there. But it is another tenacious broadleaf plant with a root system that once it starts establishing itself, um, very difficult to get rid of. But it is coming from someplace. It's not like a dandelion getting blown in. It's an ornamental that's probably been planted and now it's coming in on the lawn. So it needs to be figured that out so it can stop encroaching. All right, uh, Kelly <clears throat> lives along a river and last year the, uh, the river flooded and eroded the bank. What is the best way to restore it? What kind of plants? Well, that would probably be something to talk to your local conservation group down there. Um, they can probably give you plant lists of what they re recommend for the area and stuff like that. Um, um, I know up here, you know, a lot of the natives they'd like to do for these restoration projects and stuff like that, but you know, uh, dogwoods, ferns, salals and stuff like that, but they probably give you a uh, good plant lists and let you know <clears throat> times to plant and what they would recommend uh, for those types of areas. So I would get a hold of your local, like, um, like up the extension agency again or something like that or a conservation corps. All right, uh, Paul would like to know if dairy farm compost is suitable. Yep, 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 good stuff again. And I think again, as long as it's been composted well where it's been broken down, um, it adds nutrition and adds that life to the soil immediately. But uh, I mean, they use manures for agricultural lads for eons, right? I mean, that's kind of what they did. So uh, as long as it's been broken down, so it's not still like steamy and stuff like that, a fantastic product. All right, uh, so Kate says, we have a layer of gravel in our soil, soil profile. That's hard to say. How many inches of soil are needed to grow grass and or clover? So they have like a gravel layer that they're trying to grow on top of. I would think you probably need at least three or four inches of soil. I mean, that would be a pretty big, pretty big renovation project to lay that much on top of it. Um, if it's really compacted soil, you'd almost have to break that up first because <clears throat> you don't want it where it's gonna you know, have good soil on top of a impervious layer because that means that once it hits that layer, the water is not gonna move and then you'll just have a perched water table. So even if you use good soils, it'll never drain itself off. So that might be something that if it's really, really compacted gravel, you're gonna have to break that up before putting any soils on it. And then you might only need a couple inches. Um, but you know, if you're just wanting where it's gonna be growing down into good soil, you're probably gonna need three or four inches of soil on top of that after it's broken up. All right. Um, so next, let's see. Uh, you mentioned a soil testing website. Can you uh, say what the name of that company was again? Yep, it's Simply Soil Testing. <laughs> I saw the kitty cat, Rachel. <laughs> Simply Soil Testing in Burlington. And you guys might even have, like I know in King County up here, they were, for some King County residents, they were, uh, I think it was the county was giving them a free soil test. So I don't know if something like that goes on down there or if you guys have a company down there. Walt, do you know of any local? Uh, I, don't know, I don't know of any free opportunity, but there are a couple of soil test companies on the Tide Flats. Okay. If you were to uh, look, look up soil testing here in Pierce County, they're, they're, they're here. Yep, so, and usually again, for a very nominal price, they'll give you fantastic information. So most of the soil companies are pretty, uh, pretty spot on on that way. Right, okay, so we have a question from Karen. I bought Pierce County's Sound Grow, but it's listed as 670. That's too much phosphorus, right? Too much phosphorus for a uh, for a lawn. That's so that's more like a balanced fertilizer. So you could probably use that in your uh, flower beds or your vegetable beds or something like that. But that's way too much for for turf grass. Yeah. 
All right. So the last question we have, oh, we got one more. Um, so how do you get rid of yellow archangel? Yellow archangel? I am not familiar with that plant. Is that is it in their lawn or is it a garden weed? I'm, I have not heard of that before. Yellow archangel? Um, let's see. Uh, I know so you, if you, you, can, you can get rid of carpenter ants by not paying union wages. <laughs> I do know that, but I don't know about yellow archangel. I would almost need to have the botanical name to be able to look it up to know what it is, but I don't know that common name. Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, so our last question is about accessing the recording of this program. So Walt, do you want to talk a little bit about where the recordings of the webinars will be? Yes, I'm sorry, I'm unmuting. Uh, yes, uh, the recordings will be on the City of University Place website and also on the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department website. This recording, uh, it will take a little time because we, uh, M Agency helps us out with putting closed captioning on our webinars. So they're, you're, they're gonna, gonna do that and then we'll post them. So it might be a little while, but you could check back with us. Um, also, there's already a, a couple of uh, webinars on the sites now, but uh, it'll be a little while before we get a chance to get these up, but good question. All right, well, that's all the questions we have. So, uh, Walt, I will let you wrap it up. Great, well, thank you, Lad, and thank you to all the participants. So we had a real good group, big group tonight, uh, interested. Uh, thank you for your interest in this subject. And I wanna encourage you to spread the word, help spread the word, maybe in your uh, friends, neighbors, family, to see if we can get to where we're not using as many chemicals on lawns and in our yard and help improve water quality. Uh, so thanks to all the panel members tonight. And again, thanks, Lad, you're always uh, very entertaining and you have lots and lots of information for us. And uh, I always learn something every time I listen to you too. So thank you and thanks M Agency for your work with as a host here tonight, okay? Our pleasure, thanks everybody. Thank you. Good night.